These rankings are based almost entirely, almost, not entirely, but almost entirely on a survey of academic respondents. So if, if some, anyone's responsible for India's ranking, it's India's own academics. India's intellectuals as a class seem to have a moral panic about Mr. Modi and seem to be thoroughly so opposed to his administration that they would call India a fascist state simply because he's the one in charge. They may believe that they're doing what's best for India. In their actions, they are taking anti-India actions because it's very different to dislike the government than to dislike the state. And they seem to be conflating their appraisal of who won the election with their appraisal of the electoral process itself. Namaste and welcome to the Bharat Vartha podcast. If this is your first time here, we curate conversations on politics, policy and culture focused on India. Follow or subscribe to us to stay updated. And if you like our content already, then don't forget to rate and review us on your favorite platforms. It'll help more people discover Bharat Vartha. On this episode, I speak to Professor Salvatore Babonis, who is a sociologist and his research focuses on the political economy of the Indo-Pacific region. He's the author or editor of 10 books and more than two dozen academic research articles. He publishes extensively on public policy issues and is currently an associate professor at the University of Sydney. Recently, he shot to fame for his views on the global democracy rankings and how they gave India, to quote him, a bum rap. On this podcast, we speak about his background, how he got into researching this fascinating subject, uh, how the rankings are flawed and what we can do about it, and finally, about the social sciences and the need for reform in them. This was a fascinating chat. I really liked it and I hope you do too. So let's dive into this conversation with Professor Salvatore Babonis. Welcome, Professor Babonis. Uh, thank you so much for making the time. Oh, my pleasure. Fantastic. So I'd like to start with a, a little bit of a light question. You were in India for about eight days. What was your favorite uh, meal that you had here? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very convenient for me traveling in India because I'm a vegetarian. Okay. And so India is one of the few places that as a vegetarian, you don't have to ask for special meals and you don't have to worry about a, a steak dinner being cooked exactly the way it was, but replaced with mushrooms instead of steak. <laughs> instead, you can get actual vegetarian food that was intended to be vegetarian. But I, I have to say, I had tons of food that I'd never seen before because we get, you know, we don't get a lot of variety of Indian food right. in the West. We get pretty much the same kind of, you know, curries with rice and naan, <laughs> you know, sort of options. And uh, I had this fantastic biryani. I don't remember the name of it, forgive me, but it was some kind of leaf that the leaf then had a paste placed on it and then it was rolled up oh, I, and I then get it, yeah. into segments and then stewed in a biryani and uh, it was really fantastic yeah. so uh, i think they call it uh, they call it cooking on a dumb basically so it is uh, cooked under steam pressure um yeah i mean we i don't know but i it, it was it was my favorite food that i think that i've ever oh, had awesome awesome yeah we have like uh, amazing diversity of vegetarian food here so, you know, your background is really, really interesting. You're an American in Australia and you have an engineering degree and study the social sciences. Now, that's a bit of an unconventional background and your interest in India and China, especially, right? I mean, it's, I, I you know, saw your content, the videos and the podcasts and everything. And it, you have very unique views on this, right? I mean, is there a particular vantage point that you have being sort of an outsider looking in? So first, I shouldn't have unique views, and I'm I, I'm shocked to find that I do. But <laughs> you seem to be right. Um, look, first of all, I'm not a real engineer. I know there are lots <laughs> of real engineers in the audience. I do have a master of science in engineering, but in applied mathematics. So essentially, in statistics. So statistics and sociology do go together yeah. very well. If I were a real engineer, it might be an odd combination. But stats and sociology are. Um, you know, are, are very well connected, especially in the U.S. and uh, in continental Europe, especially in Germany, which is where sociology is highly statistical. My own work has been on quantitative cross-national comparisons, so analyses that use countries as cases in statistical modeling. And I've contributed in that area both substantively, writing articles and books in the area, and also methodologically, so writing one major book, editing three books, you know, and writing papers on the methodology of quantitative macro comparative uh, sociology where we use countries as cases in statistical analyses. So that bring, brought me very naturally to the study of rankings. 
I myself have been very interested in what are called latent variable models, models where we use observed indicators to try to measure something that is fundamentally unobservable. Mm. So democracy is something that we can't see, we can't put our fingers on, but we know it's there and we know it through its manifestations. And so we use things like indices to try to construct some way to get at the spirit of democracy, even though we can't measure you know, democracy itself in the same way that we can measure temperature of a, of a fluid, you know, or the, the speed of an object, right? So we have to measure democracy indirectly. My interest in China and India really came from a broad research interest in middle-income countries. And I've been studying middle-income countries really throughout my academic career with an initial focus on development in Russia and East Central Europe, later on economic growth in China. And when I started to study India, I, I first co-authored a BRICS book about Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And then I became interested in the Indian economy. And I fully intended that I would be studying the Indian economy, not Indian democracy. But I very quickly came to the realization that, well, first, the data on the economy are really bad. <laughs> so, you know, government of India, if you're listening, yeah. Reserve Bank, like, hire someone to improve your websites. You know, you really just need a better data portal for economic data on India. But the second thing was that Indian democracy was just incredibly more fascinating. Mm. India is, and I, I keep telling people this, it is the world's, it, it is by far the world's most exceptionally successful democracies, uh, the, the most extraordinarily successful democracies. And I say extraordinarily successful from a statistical standpoint. Um, Finland is ordinarily successful, a you know, rich Northern European country that's been independent for a hundred something years. Yeah, we expect it to be a democracy. You know, Australia is ordinarily successful, a, a rich set British settler colonial state. You know, we would expect it to be a democracy. We don't expect a post-colonial state in Eurasia with a GDP per capita of just over $2,000 per year to be a democracy. In fact, you can't point to any others. Uh, I, I mean... Not a single other post-colonial state remained a democracy throughout its entire post-colonial history, maybe with the exception of some small island states, but, but no major post-colonial state has remained a democracy throughout its entire history. If you look at Eurasia, there are only, you know, if you look for well-institutionalized democracies in Eurasia, that is countries that have had minimum three decades of peaceful elections and peaceful transfer of power between parties, you're looking at Korea on one end and Israel on the other end, and the only one in the middle is India. Yeah. And then, of course, at GDP per capita 2000, there's not a single other country that has a record of even 30 years, never mind 75 years, of elections with peaceful transfer of power between opposing parties. And in fact, you really have to go up, I mean, even Eastern Europe, which is where you find countries that you know, maybe $10,000, $12,000 GDP that have a 30-year record of transfer, a peaceful transfer in power, they are not really fully indigenous homegrown democracies because, of course, they had to be democracies to get into the European Union. So if we look at countries that indigenously developed their own democracy with no prompting from outside, that just decided to be a democracy on their of their own volition, you're looking at $30,000 GDP. I mean, you're looking at places like Taiwan and South Korea to find the next well-institutionalized democracy in terms of GDP per capita. So, you know, India is really, and I keep using this word, extraordinarily successful, unexpectedly successful. And for me as a quantitative social scientist, that really drove my interest in India. It is an exceptional case. Right. So you found India through India's uniqueness uh, in some sense, right? Were you surprised by the reception that you had in India? I mean, uh, you know, you got millions of views, uh, invited to speak at a bunch of different places and so much of positive response. Look, I was surprised at the scale of it. Uh, you know, obviously I was aware that a research paper and then a you know an interview based on that paper where I essentially said that Indian democracy was successful. I, I was aware that it would be well received in India, obviously. Yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> That it would become a media circus, that I would be on national television, that I would do a dozen different podcasts. No, no, I, I was I was not prepared for that. And in fact, I'm still paying the price for that because I am an academic with papers to grade. <laughs> and I've been so busy, you know, with the trip to India and with all the media work that uh, it's starting to be a problem. So 
yeah, it really did take the scale of the response really did take me by surprise. And it, it's been you know heartwarming. Uh, it really has been gratifying. And uh, I certainly appreciate it. Right. You know, you've spoken a fair bit about these rankings and will not delve into much of that uh, so that, you know, uh, I think people, those who are interested in that can check out the India Today Conclave video or, uh, sure. you know, my friend Kushal Mehra's podcast uh, as well, where you spoke about these things. But I had a few follow up questions on those, right, which is that. Sure, what sure. is the purpose of these rankings? You spoke about the VDM rankings, the economist rankings and so on. Is there a specific purpose? Because oftentimes I think there's a temptation in India to impute some sort of a grand design and a narrative to, you know, the, the supposed bias that we see, right? Or perhaps very real bias that we see against India. Each of them has a different purpose, but I should stress that none of them has the purpose of particularly ranking India. All three major ranking organizations rank 150 or more countries in a single exercise every year. So there, there's no particular focus in these organizations on India. The Economist Intelligence Unit rankings mainly exist because the Economist Intelligence Unit generates consulting revenue for The Economist magazine. And this is kind of a loss leader, right? They spend a little money on the rankings so that they can generate consulting work from companies that want political risk advice. And it's just something to brand them and to make them a, a bigger presence in this field. So it's a for-profit entity. The Economist Intelligence Unit. The Freedom House is a U.S. government-sponsored think tank. Uh, most of its budget comes from the U.S. State Department. And its purpose is much more to provide an, a, a semi-official or quasi-official take on behalf of the U.S. government. Uh, now, it is independent. It doesn't take orders from the State Department. But ultimately, the kind of people who work at Freedom House are former State Department employees who then get parked at Freedom House when their administration is out of out of uh, office, that sort of thing. And Freedom House represents the broad American consensus viewpoint of what's important in other countries. And its, and its rankings primarily inform the U.S. government. So about which countries are free, partially free, not free, are there three basic categories. And then they also weigh in on territories like Kashmir. Uh, that is you know, disputed territories like Kashmir. The Varieties of Democracy Institute is the only one of the three that is a truly independent academic ranking Authority. It is based in the Department of Politics at uh, the University of Jotunberg in Sweden. It's run by a, a prominent Africanist who studies African democracy, and it is mostly funded by academic research grants. So it's funded by primarily the European Research Council, but then other academic organizations also give grants to BDEM, as it's known, the Rise of Democracy Institute. As a result of its perceived independence, VDEM has then been embedded in other rankings. So, for example, you know, we had a I had a bit of a debate with Shekhar Gupta over the Cato Institute's Human Freedom Index. Yeah. The Human Freedom Index, its democracy components simply come from VDEM. Similarly, the U.S. Agency for National Development uses VDEM's governance indicators in its own uh, governance reports. Uh, the World Bank uses VDEM inputs in its governance reports. So, because it's academic and independent, it has become the go-to organization for international organizations that want a neutral, independent view of democracy that's not linked to a, you know, an economist is, is a for-profit corporation, yeah. you know, or, but also is not linked to the U.S. government like Freedom House is. That's become a problem for India because, of course, it's VDEM that rates India worst of all of the three major rankings agencies. Right. You spoke a fair deal about the rankings influencing policy, right? But is there a case for the other way around? Can these rankings be used by, let's say, foreign policy measures by some other governments to sort of adversely impact uh, India or, you know, uh, favorably impact themselves? In principle, I guess they could, but I see no evidence that they have. Uh, I mean, it's always possible and lobbying does go on, but primarily the rankings reflect the consensus views of academics mostly academics, 85%. VDEM says that 85% of its survey respondents are academics. It mainly reflects the views of academics in the country being studied. So the kind of people who would be behind the VDEM rankings would be deans, prominent political scientists, uh, maybe some human rights activists in India itself who are considered experts on Indian democracy. Now, they would, they would also potentially survey experts from outside India on Indian democracy, but the majority would be people in India itself. So it's not governments that are trying to affect these. And it's not like some other rankings, like, you know, we, we, I've talked to some people about the uh, World Hunger Index, where that relies on government data. Yeah. And so governments can and do 
influence their position on the hung world hunger index. Uh, these rankings are based almost entirely, almost, not entirely, but almost entirely on a survey of academic respondents. So if, if so, anyone's responsible for India's ranking, it's India's own academics. Right. You know, you've called out the egregious uh, sort of errors in some of these rankings, right? Are these organizations aware of this? The fact that, you know, some of their uh, scores and rankings do not reflect reality. I mean, uh, you know, famously, you talk about the uh, press freedom in India, right? And where they've ranked, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan uh, above India or India lower than Hong Kong. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Below Hong, below Hong Kong. Kong, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. so are these organizations aware that, you know, there are, there are mistakes in this and are they doing anything to kind of overcome, uh, let's say, uh, these errors or biases and so on? Look, VDEM must be very aware that it ranks India, which for whatever else you may say about it, has you know a very robust electoral democracy. VDEM on its electoral democracy dimension rates India just two notches above Myanmar, <laughs> which is run by a military junta. If VDEM's considering India to be an electoral democracy roughly on a par with Myanmar, post-coup Myanmar, I emphasize, not pre-coup Myanmar, they must be aware that, that you know, people are going to attack these rankings. Now, they do adduce a lot of evidence in support of their rankings. This evidence, as far as I know, comes from the people who answer the surveys. So that the people who are ranking the country seem to feed evidence through in support of their rankings. I, I don't know that for certain VDEM is not clear about where the textual narrative comes from. They, they're very clear about where the numeric score comes from. Uh, not so clear about where the textual narrative comes from. Uh, but when they saw this textual narrative, whether it came from others or whether they wrote it themselves, they should have been very aware of the misrepresentation, the mendacity, yeah. in some cases, just fabrications involved in the textual narratives. So one thing in particular is the, you know, the accusation that the Electoral Commission of India has become compromised in recent years. And they just state that without any footnote, without any evidence being adduced, as if everyone knows that. Well, I tried to find accusations. You know, I went systematically through a media search to find out, were there any accusations of bias in the Electoral Commission of India? And all that pops up is one letter, one uh, open letter by a group of former government servants who were very unhappy that the Electoral Commission of India had not censured Narendra Modi for uh, publicizing a missile launch during the blackout period of the 2019 election. Now, that's questionable. We, we might ask, is that appropriate or not? But to base an allegation that the Electoral Commission of India is no longer neutral on that, <laughs> you know, that's that's pretty weak. Now, now there was worse. I mean, there was absolute mendacity in some cases. So the, the um, there was mendacity in the use of FIRs for sedition, first indication reports for sedition, which were clearly manipulated to show a trend when, in fact, if you look at the full data, there was no trend. Yet, you know, the activist NGO that produced the report on sedition, their appraisal was taken at face value by the rankings agencies without them looking into it to see was this report actually correct. Or, you know, some things I find even really ridiculous is the FCRA, the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act, yeah. that was passed and I believe it was 2010. Yet it's adduced as evidence of the decline in Indian democracy in 2019. Now, if VDEM and other organizations had rated India as a low quality democracy already in 2010, okay, they could use the FCRA, they could use the fact that the CPI Maoist was banned under the UAPA, which is another thing they mentioned. They could mention the use of sedition in you know, political use of sedition charges. All of these things, they might be bad. I, I'm not here, I'm not able to judge just how bad these things are. I am, however, able to judge that these things have not gotten worse in the last 12 years. And if they've not gotten worse, then there is really no justification for this massive downgrading of Indian democracy. I, I can't tell you whether you're Indian, you tell me whether Indian democracy is as bad as Myanmar's. I'm not living it, I can't say. But the idea that it has declined dramatically has to be based on evidence of new declines since 2014. And I think I'm comfortable in saying that, well, I don't think any really relevant evidence was adduced to show any decline in Indian democracy since 2014. Instead, problems, and often, and if you go through the footnotes, often they were literally citing, you know, activists was arrested. And you think, oh, that's terrible, activists was arrested. You go through the links, and the activist was arrested in 2003. <laughs> well, wait a minute, you know, how can that represent a decline in democracy between 2014 and 2022?
Yeah. So we run a weekly news show and every week, uh, you know, we, we cover the news and events of the week and, uh, you know, a bunch of these rankings, each time they, ca- they come out, I mean, it's so frustrating for us because it has no basis in reality. And it's almost like uh, we're being told what our reality is in some sense, right? You know, some of these poor ratings, is it somewhere linked to kind of a moral panic, you know, caused by the rise of Trump and Brexit and uh, that framework being used uh, as such? I mean, they view, you know, Prime Minister Modi as a right wing authoritarian, uh, authoritarianism or a fascist, as they call it, right? Do you think that that kind of a bias or framework sort of impacts these rankings? Look, I want to make it absolutely clear, and I've said this many times, forgive me for saying it again, primarily the negative rankings and the drop in these rankings come is an accurate reflection of the views of India's own intellectuals. Right. Not every intellectual, but India's intellectuals as a class seem to have a moral panic about Mr. Modi and seem to be thoroughly so opposed to his administration that they would call India a fascist state simply because he's the one in charge. Mm-hmm. Now, fascism is a strong word. I've seen no evidence, as someone who studied fascism, I see no evidence of actual fascism in India. You really have to stretch to make the comparisons. It's kind of like, you know, Hitler was a vegetarian and the Hindus are vegetarians. So, you know, the Hindus must be fascist. It's this sort of reasoning that I see. I see a lot of mention of the RSS and it's routinely called a, you know, the Rashtriya Samsvak Song. It's routinely called a paramilitary organization equated with Mussolini's brown shirts. I see absolutely no evidence that that is true. People may not like the RSS. They may view it as, you know, too conservative for their liking. They may not like that so many organizations are connected under one umbrella, but it's not fundamentally different from the Social Democratic Party in Sweden which has a social democratic trade union and a social democratic farmers union and a social democratic set of schools and, you know, social democratic uh, sort of nursery schools, I'm sorry, you know, social democratic youth groups. It's not fundamentally different. It's different in philosophy, of course, and in origins, but the organization, I've seen no evidence that the organization has been used by Narendra Modi in the way that the brown shirts were used by Mussolini to, you know, organize pogroms to beat up political opponents and to seize power by marching on Delhi to take over control of the country's institutions. So, you know, the comparisons can be made, but comparisons can be made to, we're all, we can all make comparisons to fascism in just about everything we do. So honestly, there's just not much there, there. Right. Uh, Okay. And, but I routinely hear my fellow academics in India and who study India liken Narendra Modi's India to a fascist regime. Now, I think that's overinflated language. They also equated Donald Trump's America to a fascist regime. Joe Biden, my own president, as you said, I'm American. He has equated Republicans to fascists. I think we all need to shrug our shoulders these days when we hear fascist and just not take allegations so seriously. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think overall people need to kind of dial it down, right? Uh, and have some yeah. uh, measure of responsibility with the, the kind of labels and the words that they use, uh, for sure. You know, for and on both sides. Yeah, of course. I, I, I mean, I, yeah. I've heard. You know, I, I've routinely heard conservatives in India call you know university professors anti-national, traitors, you, you know, Pakistan lovers, supporters of terrorism. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's also yeah. heated language that is, is that goes far beyond the reality of people who simply oppose the government and the policies it stands yeah. for. I think in general, labels are pretty dumb. I mean, they're very low resolution sort of explanation for you know where someone is coming from. You know, for lay people who are kind of listening to this, uh, how should they look at these ra- rankings? You know, I mean, how do they call BS on some of this stuff? I mean, other than, you know, just some basic statistics 101, like uh, looking at, uh, you know, absolute numbers in the case of India, right? I mean, population of 1.4 obviously will beat any metric, right, on, on that scale. Uh, Other than that, you know, any two or three things that you would suggest for them to, you know, take these with a grain of salt? No, look, the rankings are a problem. And they're a problem because not only in India and other countries as well, the kinds of people who are surveyed for the rankings like to use external institutions to validate their own internal political positions. Uh, So, you know, if an Indian academic feels that the Modi regime is fascist, well, that's one thing that person might be dismissed. But that person is then surveyed by a neutral, well-credentialed international organization like VDEM, answers the survey and says the Modi regime, regime is fascist. 
then that comes back from <laughs> VDEM as an impartial external valuation of Indian democracy, and then can be used so that the same intellectual who started this process can now say, look, even VDEM agrees that India is today fascist. All right. So this becomes a real problem because it becomes solidified into, if not objective truth, into received wisdom. Mm. Right. So Wikipedia ultimately accepts it. Why does Wikipedia accept it? Well, there's tons of documentation. Aid organizations start to accept it. Uh, ratings agencies start to accept it. Major newspapers start to accept it. So you routinely see major newspapers, if not call India fascist, they will certainly call it you know, semi-fascist or on the road to fascism or no longer a true democracy. And that is harmful for India. Now, it's not only harmful for India, it's harmful for other countries that, for which the same process is occurring. But it happens more for India, I think, than for any other country. And it is something that, you know, I think should concern Indians, that it does have the potential to have real world impact, not just in India's own politics, but with external perceptions of India. Yeah, I mean, I, I see the rankings also have a real impact in terms of investments and so on, right? I mean, potentially, if the Indian government uh, decides to take this seriously, and I think they will, how should they sort of rectify these uh, rankings? Any way of influencing these rankings? Uh, you mentioned, you know, data, for example, right? Put, put out a more yeah. high quality data. Is there anything else that uh, they could do? So first thing is the Indian government has not countered these effectively. The Indian government, as far as I can tell, has been extremely defensive and has simply said that the rankings represent a Western imperialist approach to you know, Indian democracy and that Indian democracy can't be held to the same. You know, Indian democracy is sui generis. It's something different. And it's wrong to judge Indian democracy on standards concocted in Europe or Washington. I think that response is very short-sighted. You know, now, that response, remember, the Indian government is a political entity. It's run by politicians. And that response may be well calibrated to generate votes in India. Okay, I'm never going to try to give political advice to the BJP. I mean, it's an extraordinarily successful political party. But I will give advice on international statistics to the BJP. If they actually wanted to counter the rankings, they should be doing exactly what I did in my August research paper, just pointing out the errors. Instead of defensively criticizing the entire process as corrupt, it should be saying this claim was made in the rankings However, it pertains to a period before the current government took office. This claim was made in the rankings, but it is empirically false. You know, here is the correct answer. Uh, you know, that is, it should be countering specific claim instead of just having a broad dismissal of the rankings if it wants to be taken seriously. Now, I'm not sure that the Indian government wants to be taken seriously. Um, they may not care about the rankings so much as they care about winning votes. And remember, it's, you know, I doubt very many Indians are going to vote against Narendra Modi because he is poorly ranked yeah. by a Swedish institute. But some Indians might vote for Narendra Modi because he stands up to a Swedish institute. So, you know, I'm, I'm a bit I, I always wonder if the the lack of appropriate response from the government is simply due to lack of knowledge or if it is due to political calculations. Either way, while it may be good for the BJP, I, I don't think it's necessarily good for India to be so defensive instead of being calm, patient, and interested primarily in setting the record straight. Right, right. You know, you've spoken about the intellectual class in India being anti-India, and I think that really got everyone riled up. There were rebuttals and whatnot. Yeah. So let, let me try to steel man the case, right? I mean, I could say that, you know, intellectuals everywhere across the world are sort of anti, anti whatever the establishment yeah. is, the convention is, right? I mean, in some yeah. sense, they have to, right? I mean, they have to look, uh, look at the other side of, uh, you know, some of these things. In that sense, yeah. are Indian intellectuals unique in some sense? So I wouldn't say all across the world, but certainly in the United States, yeah. in Australia, Australian intellectuals routinely call the Australian government racist and anti-indigenous. You know, American intellectuals routinely call the U.S. government racist and, you know, all sorts of other names. Other countries, not necessarily. So in many European countries, intellectuals are part of the governing establishment. So, for example, in the countries where they rank highest on these rankings, intellectuals are firmly part of the governing class. And here I'm thinking of the Scandinavian countries, so Norway, Denmark, Sweden, uh, but also uh, New Zealand. You know, New Zealand, it's a very small elite in New Zealand, and there's a lot of cross-breeding between academics and the governing class, right? in a way that in the U.S. it's very rare for academics 
to have any role in government. So I think there is to some extent natural that in countries where intellectuals are not embedded in the ruling establishment, they would take a dim view of their country's democracy. And I think this is does explain why Indian democracy has been downgraded so thoroughly since 2014. Since before 2014, Indian intellectuals, what you guys call the, you know, the con market gang, you know, Leuton's Delhi, this whole group of people were very much part of the governing institutions of India. You know, very much were listened to by governments in India. Their expertise was respected. Their opinions mattered. And suddenly after 2014, there was a populist government in charge in Delhi that uh, was not so enamored of the English-speaking credentialed university intellectual class. It, it was a, a very much a new India government that was in charge from 2014. You know, it wasn't Vajpayee's BJP that took power in 2014. It was Narendra Modi's BJP that book took power in 2014. So it's not surprising then when, when the government stopped listening to them, intellectuals felt spurned. And, you know, hell hath no fury like an intellectual spurned. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised to see it, but I think it's not just a general intellectual questioning of government. There are very specific reasons why the relationship between intellectuals and government changed in India after 2014. And why after 2019, because most of the rankings only slightly declined until they fell off the chart after 2019. And I suspect that was because for the first five years, it wasn't clear that Modi would be reelected. Many intellectuals may have cherished the hope that this would be an aberration. You know, after all, the NDA won, but the BJP did not have a majority itself. The, it, you know, the NDA as a whole had a majority. So it's not at all clear that, you know, they felt like all was lost <laughs> versus after 2019 with the BJP having an absolute majority, you know, the gloves came off, you know, no holds barred, uh, you know, Indian intellectuals were out to get the government. And when I say that they were anti-India, I don't mean that in their hearts, they're anti-India. And in fact, I started to say that accidentally on an interview that in their hearts, they're anti-India. And I said, no, 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 let me take that back. What I mean to say is whatever they feel in their hearts, which may be very pro-India, they may, they may believe that they're doing what's best for India in their actions. They are taking anti-India actions because it's very different to dislike the government than to dislike the state. And they seem to be conflating their appraisal of who won the election with their appraisal of the electoral process itself. And that's why that phrase that went viral, Indian intellectuals as a class are anti-India, because their actions have been anti-India. Whatever they may think in their heart, yeah. they're behaving in a way that is not anti-BJP. They're behaving in a way that is anti-India. Right. You've spoken about the the, the intellectual class and uh, the expert class uh, per se, right? And how they don't necessarily mirror the views of the mass population. You know, is there a way of sort of bridging the distance uh, between these two categories? I mean, because I, I see that, you know, it, it, experts are necessary, right? I mean, we do need people who kind of study and observe yeah. things and uh, inform people for sure. Uh, but there is this massive mistrust uh, among people for all things yeah. expert, right? And you could, you know, trace it back to perhaps the Donald Trump election or even before that, right? So there is this sort of growing distance. How would you suggest we can bridge this distance? I, I think intellectuals have to have a bit more modesty. I talk to other academics and intellectuals all the time, and I have to say most members of my class feel that they are owed a position by society. That is, they are owed the lifelong support that we get to live in an ivory tower and think on behalf of society. I take a very different view. I mean, I don't come from this class. I come from a, a very petit bourgeois, you know, small business family class. And, you know, I, I feel extraordinarily honored to have had the ability to live a life of reflection where I have the autonomy to think about the world without the daily pressure of having to earn a living. And I'm very aware that hundreds of people, literally hundreds, have to work hard to pay taxes to support just my salary. That every intellectual has hundreds or in many cases, thousands of people who are working and paying taxes to pay their salary. It's kind of like in the olden days in India where a Brahmin would be granted a village to support him, <laughs> right? And you know, you could be a Brahmin priest and, and what supported you? Well, we'll give you this village and you can have the receipts of that village to support you as a, as a priest. 
Well, it's the same. It's the exact same thing. I mean, it's now modernized and on a bureaucratized basis, but I feel extraordinarily humbled by having so many people work so hard to allow me to have this essentially life of leisure to think about the world. And and that's why I'm so grateful to people. That's why I'm always thanking people. I always respond. Everyone who writes to me, I, I always respond. Now, on Twitter, I, I haven't been able to respond to everybody who's commented. I, I used to respond to every single person who commented on something I said. That's become impossible in the last three weeks. And, you know, I try. But every email I receive, and I often have people saying, oh, I'm amazed you wrote back. I said, why are you amazed? I, I'm paid to answer your emails. I'm paid to be an educator. And I think if, if intellectuals really want to have an effect on society, it's their responsibility to go into the public sphere, to write articles, to speak. You know, most academics disdain the idea of writing an article for a website. You know, no, no, they write academic peer reviewed journal articles. And it's like, well, if you disdain the idea of writing for a website, of communicating with ordinary people, with, with, with having to write for a newspaper where you only get 600 words. And, and so you have to put things in simple, direct, straightforward terms, short, you know, you have to simplify. You can't go into all your academic niceties. You can't cite your favorite authors. You just have to engage in debate with everyone else in society. Most academics and intellectuals simply aren't willing to come to their readers on those terms. And then you shouldn't be surprised that people don't respect you. Right now, I honestly believe in this is not just me kind of trying to position myself or I mean, I'm really sincere here and you can go back into my prior writing. I think you'll find a lot of evidence of it that it's our responsibility. If we want to be taken seriously as intellectuals, it's our responsibility to go out in the public sphere and talk to people as equals, not as professors professing the truth, but as equals, taking other people seriously as well. And I think if we do that, we'll be taken more seriously ourselves. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I must say, I wrote to you maybe a day after the India Today conclave, uh, and I was so pleasantly surprised to hear back from you. I mean, uh, th thank you. Thank you again for that. But you, shouldn't, but you shouldn't even have to thank me. I mean, all I'm doing is my job. <laughs> you know, I'm literally paid by the public, the pu well, public of Australia, not the public of India, but I'm paid by the public of Australia to be a source of information on political sociology. Why wouldn't I write back? I mean, that's, you know, what else do I have to do? <laughs> you know, this is, this is my job. So I, I'm glad you appreciated it, but please, it, it's nothing special. You know, the taxpayers are paying me, not the other way around. Right. Yeah. I, I do hope more people think like you. You know, is there a, when you look at the social sciences education and you've spoken about university education in Australia, I've listened to a few of your podcasts there as well. Is there sort of a systemic problem? I mean, we, we look at things like, you know, uh, most of the papers are hardly cited. This whole peer review process is again, yeah. I mean, you can talk about the flaws of the peer review process. And then there is, you know, Professor uh, Jonathan Head's uh, research as well in terms of people's political leanings and how it sort of stimmies uh, uh, basically free expression in a classroom or uh, diversity of yeah. thought and so on and so forth, right? I mean, we can go into a whole litany of things that are sort of flawed. But if you were to suggest a sort of reform for the social sciences, what would be your three or four point prescription? Look, the peer review process is absolutely broken and everybody who's honest knows that it's broken. Anyone who served as an editor knows that it's broken. You know, papers get accepted because, you know, people like what you had to say, not because of the quality of what you said. In the, hard, in the harder sciences, there's what's called a replication crisis, meaning that, you know, people do, so it's not just social sciences, you know, in psychology, in laboratory sciences, we're finding that, you know, one team does research, they publish it, they publish their experimental protocol, but you know what, the next team can't replicate it. <laughs> you know, so how true was it, right? So th this is a crisis all across the, the sciences and especially in the social sciences where we have fewer objective criteria on which to judge papers. Honestly, I, I don't think there's a solution for it. I think all institutions have a sell-by date and I think universities are rapidly approaching theirs. You know, if we think about it, the intellectual and scientific research and, and advance has not always been located in the universities. The idea that the university is the primary institution where research occurs and where knowledge moves forward only really congealed around 1900, eight, between 1890 and 1910. It was the key period where the system of majors was organized, where universities uh, took on this research mission that then they have you know, carried through into the, you know, for the next 120 years. Before that, societies like the Royal Society in the UK, uh, I know there were similar societies in India, uh, I forget the 
exact name. India's first Nobel Prize did not go to a university based researcher. It went to a researcher who was a member of, and I forget the name of the, the Indian Research Society. You know, so research hasn't always been in universities and increasingly today it's not in universities. So there are entire fields that have moved outside universities. For example, if, if you want to study cuneiform tablets, you know, the tablets from ancient Sumeria in the Middle East, the true experts are now hobbyists mm. because universities no longer have professors of Assyriology. Instead, it's hobbyists who are you know, most engaged in it. Um, military history has become an area where advanced hobbyists, that is people who do military history either because they enjoy it or people who do it for money, that is authors who write books on military history for a profit. They're the primary sources of, of new research on military history, not the universities. So we'll see field after field. I mean, certainly in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, the really big advances being made in the last few years have been ma being made by corporations in Silicon Valley, not by universities. Now, I think a lot of the arts and social sciences, the humanities and social sciences, I think we're going to be among the first areas to drop out of the university to the point where most humanities and social science advances will not be made in a university setting. They'll be made by people working outside universities. University departments will dwindle and shrink. And we already see signs of that. You mentioned very few academic papers being cited. Well, people are still really interested in society. Look at the massive discourse in India right now on the identity of India, all these books that have Bharat in the title. Okay. This huge discourse is occurring outside universities by people who are extremely intelligent, who are extremely well-informed, who are doing their own research, who know their material. It's just not being done in university humanities departments. University humanities departments have you know, narrowed their vision so much that they're no longer taking on the big issues of interest to society. And so society has moved ahead without them. I dare say that right now on most topics of interest to most people, you could find more detailed research and analysis on YouTube than you could find in a university classroom. And I don't think that's necessarily a, a bad thing. Mm. So for perhaps a young person listening to this who wants to pursue one of these uh, subjects, right? You would recommend self-study and YouTube over the university? You need a university for two things. Uh, there's some forms of technical learning that it's just really hard to be so disciplined to do it yourself. I mean, I never would have become a statistician if I'd had to do it. All. <laughs> well, now some people are so dedicated that they would do it, but you know, I needed the structure of a textbook, classes, you know, homework to do. Maybe you don't, but you know, but I did. So some technical areas really require a university degree. I, look, if you want to be an engineer, you're going to go to a university. Yeah. You know, there's no two ways around it. But for humanities and social science topics. I'd suggest, yeah, you, you can educate yourself outside the university. You can become more educated. And let's face it, the credential isn't worth that much. You know, so having the credential of having a bachelor's in sociology or a bachelor's in political science is not particularly useful. I mean, so if I were advising a, a, an 18 year old entering university student who wanted to have a big impact in politics, as long as the person didn't say, I want to be a political science professor, the only route to becoming a political science professor is through the university. But if the person said, I want to have a big impact on politics, I'd say, oh, go study applied mathematics, you, you know, go study, you know, systems research and read political books in your spare time and apply your engineering or your mathematical knowledge to those political questions or go study languages, right? I mean, again, if, if you studied five or six languages, and you could then bring in political writings from five or six different languages into your thinking on politics, yeah. you'd be much more advanced than if you spent those same four years studying political science. Yeah. I think languages are interesting, right? I mean, because they're so intrinsically linked to culture as well. And uh, there's really so many things uh, that you could gain from studying uh, language for sure. You also talk. I'm a monolingual American, so I, I, I'm <laughs> mystified and amazed at people who speak two, three, four, five languages, but it, it's not me. <laughs> I freely admit. Yeah, I mean, I started uh, studying Japanese uh, some time back, and uh, yeah, it, it's just fascinating the way they view things. Uh, because mm -hmm. I, I suppose you know when you describe things, it's it's intrinsically to link to your culture as well, right? I mean, the way you look at things. Sure. Yeah. You know, on that note, you talk about studying indigenous systems of uh, social science, right? Uh, so in India, for example. I've been very engaged with that. Yeah, yeah I've been very yeah. committed to that. I, idea. I'd love for you to talk about that a little more, you know, I mean, how can we sort of integrate some of these indigenous systems in social science uh, study across the world and so on? 
I've mainly studied worlding concepts. So worlding is the idea of what is your world that, that you, you live in, your egocentric world. And today, of course, we think of the whole entire globe as our world because you know, it's a global world today, but that wasn't always the case. And so if we go back farther back in time, I particularly study the Chinese Tian Sha concept. So Tian Sha is heaven beneath Tian Sha or all under heaven. The Chinese concept that puts China, you know, China's name in Chinese is literally Zhongguo, which is central state, often poetically translated as middle kingdom. But all it means is that China is the place in the center. Now, every society thinks of itself as being in the center, but in China's system, it's highly hierarchical. China is the apex of civilization in the center, surrounded by the non-Chinese lands that are subject to the Chinese emperor, surrounded by the pacified barbarians, <laughs> quote unquote, you know, those that acknowledge the suzerainty of China, and then surrounded by the true barbarians, you know, farther out, you know, the, the, the Russians and the British, you know, who are arriving from outside their zone. Contrast that with the Indian Kautilian system of the mandala system. Right? So mandala system also has a series of circles, but within the mandala, there's not just one central state. The idea is there are many peer Groups And that reflects, of course, India's experience historically of not having any one central state always administering India, but rather having many mul you know, multiple states uh, vying for control of India. So in India, there's this mandala system of multiple mandalas, which then have, you know, the near enemies and a far abroad of, you know, this, this influence from abroad, which in, you might interpret as being China, you know, as the big influence outside of India. They're just different ways of thinking about worlding. Uh, the Muslim Ummah is another way of worlding. So you could think of the Islamic world where, uh, you know, in Islam, now from my very basic understanding of Islam, uh, you know, all people are brothers on an equal plane, at least all men are brothers on an equal plane. And the Muslim Ummah is the world in which Muslims live. It's you know, the Muslim world, which is much flatter and less hierarchical. There's Mecca has a special place. But other than Mecca having a special place, everything else is much flatter than, say, the Chinese system, which is very hierarchical. So we can also contrast the, the Roman Imperium Empire and the Greek hegemon, your know, hegemony. We use those somewhat interchangeably now, but they meant very different things in origin. Uh, the idea of Imperium was, well, actually, they mean exactly the same thing in its, in its ultimate origin. That is, Imperium was the rule of a general outside the city walls, and hegemony was the rule of a general outside the city walls. They came from the same original place, but very quickly in the two cultures, they came to mean two different things, with Imperium meaning much more a kind of direct control from top to bottom, one person in charge, the emperor, whereas hegemony meant something more like a a, a degree of influence, uh, you know, so uh, uh, still hierarchical, but not as, you, you know, not as direct a system of control. So these are all different world and concepts that I think, you know, if you read broadly, you get different ideas of how the world can work. Uh, you know, our, what we call Westphalian system of states, you know, arising from Europe, in the 30 years war is not the only way to organize the world. I mean, it's not, even, it's not even the only way that the world was organized in European history, but you know, it's become the dominant framework for, through which we see the world. Personally, I think it's an outmoded framework. And I use, I wrote a book called American Tian Sha to say that, no, no, our, our current world system really resembles much more the Chinese model, only instead of China being at the center, the United States is the central state of our postmodern Tian Sha. So this is something I find very interesting, but you know, you have to read a lot. You have to take people seriously. You know, I've read, I mean, I wrote a major review of the work of Alexander Dugan, who's uh, kind of thought of as, you know, Vladimir Putin's Rasputin, the inspiration for Vladimir Putin. The fact that I read Dugan and take his work seriously does not at all mean that I endorse his approach to the world. Yet, you know, he has another distinctive approach to the world that I contrast, again, in my American Tian Sha book, I contrast my view of American rule with his view of American empire. And so these are just different approaches that you, you have to read and be open to other perspectives to be aware of. When we look at the social or political discourse, right? I mean, there is a lot of uh, labeling. There's a lot of, uh, you know, putting people in buckets and so on. I mean, you've spoken about how you wrote a book on Trump and uh, uh, because you weren't explicitly yeah, yeah. anti-Trump, they, they sort of presume that, you know, you're probably pro-Trump, yeah. right? <laughs> 
with a MAGA hat. Uh, I was very proud of that book. The, <laughs> the, the Wall Street Journal named it Best on Politics 2018. And the reviewer said that he couldn't tell what my politics were. <laughs> And I thought if you could write a Trump book in 2018 and the reviewer can't tell what your political views are, you yeah, know, you've hit the sweet spot. That's quite an achievement, yeah. for sure. Right. Yeah. So how do you stay independent minded? You know, how do you resist the labels? How do you focus on exactly what you have to do? Look at things objectively in a data driven way uh, and so on. Because I'm sure that, you know, a lot of people looking at this are either subject to labels or have uh, sort of compromised on uh, things. Right. I mean. Uh, for pragmatic reasons as such. So is this is this something intrinsic? Is it something that you learned along the way? I mean, could you talk to us about that? Well, there, there are many people who would say I'm not independent minded. So I'll, <laughs> I'll accept the compliment, but I'll accept it as being a very self-serving you, you know, view that I have of myself. Um, look, I, I think there are two key things that were key in my own personal biography to shaping how I think about the world. One was from an early age, from an early part of age of my academic career, early stage, I should say, explicitly embracing a comparativist approach. That is, instead of seeing the world purely, you know, from a U.S. perspective or from a Western perspective, taking seriously other perspectives. And, and I mean, really taking seriously other perspectives, not just reading the Westernized academics in the country I studied. So, so most academics who want to take non-Western perspectives seriously, well, they'll listen to the the Indian Marxist and the German Weberian. And it's like, well, wait, they're all using Western perspectives. They're just coming from other countries. Uh, no, no. I, I mean, I want to get into the organic intellectuals of the society. You know, with regard to India, for example, I've been reading this whole pile of Bharat books, civilizational studies books. Now, these are not the credentialed intellectuals of Indian society writing. These are almost all outsider intellectuals, but they represent the organic, an organic Indian social science that's distinct from Western social science that's being done in India at, you know, JNU or Ashoka University. Okay, so, so the first thing is taking these non-Western, non-hegemonic narratives seriously, even though I largely disagree with them. I mean, you, you everyone saw that photo of me, I'm the con market gangster. <laughs> and, you know, look, I'm very aware I, I am a Western liberal, right? So, uh, but it doesn't mean that I can only read people who are Western liberals. I, I read lots of people with whom I share very little in terms of worldview, but I want to understand their worldviews. So comparativism, first principle. The second lucky thing that happened to me was taking a job outside the United States. I have to say, when I was researching, you know, as a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh, I mean, first as a student at Johns Hopkins, later as a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh, I didn't realize how blinkered my understanding was from being in the, at the center of the central state. <laughs> you know, my viewpoint was entirely one of an American Mandarin. Living in Australia, even though it's still a Western country, an English speaking country, it's not that I've learned so much from being in a foreign country. It's that being outside of the US looking in, I'm better able to see the U.S. as just one case among many, right? So, so from my perch here atop Sydney, Australia, I can look at the U.S., I can look at India, I can look at Europe, and they all, I'm looking at all of them through similar lenses. So for me, in my personal development, it was those two things, a, a commitment to comparativism, genuine comparativism, and the shift to Australia, which really had a deep personal effect on my own, you know, on my own intellectual development. Right. Fantastic. I think, you know, all of us could learn from that. I mean, take ourselves out of the cocoon that we've built around us and uh, really see perspectives for what they are, right? I mean, it could uh, benefit us all immensely. Thank you so much uh, for making the time, uh, Professor Babunas. I mean, this was an enlightening uh, discussion for me. And uh, yeah, hopefully, I mean, we'll have you back. Oh, please. I'd love to talk uh, after January. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much to do. But yeah, anytime you'd like, I'd love to be on the podcast. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bharat Vartha podcast. If you want to see more content like this, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We started Bharat Vartha to facilitate long form discussions on politics, policy and culture. We don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode. If you wish to offer us feedback, do reach out to us on social media. We are at Paratvartha on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You could also get in touch with us on our website, www.bharatvartha.in. The links are in the description below. Until next time, stay safe, take care, and jai